All right, time for another draftphysics.com, debatephysics.com also, but places like Shitopedia will not let you debate any of these subjects. They must, they'll tell you it's certain and proven and undeniable, and every reasonable person has to believe what they say the truth is, and nothing else could possibly be the truth, and so on and so on and so on and so on. They're infallible um, definers of reality. Uh, you know, they know exactly what scientists were right and what scientists were wrong. You can't disagree with them. So I don't even know if this is worth reading. Frankly, it's such little drivelly mush. So what I'll do is explain some things about electricity uh, because it's, you know, it'll be so much better than their tripe is you getting some information that might inspire in you some understanding um, of um, actually having a physical model you know, something that's, you know, you can actually um, physically understand, uh, physically, mechanically understand, let's say. Uh, and I think that is uh, doable. And so I'm going to do it for you. So as pointed out, what's basically happening in a wire is you have two choices. <laughs> okay. You can try to smash in a bunch of electrons moving with a small velocity. Or you can try to smash in a couple of electrons with a very large velocity, a very high speed. So it's just a amount of movement. You know, ones that are moving a lot of distance and are quickly, moving quickly, versus ones moving kind of slowly, less pressure. And that's voltage, the pressure, okay? Uh, you call it electrical potential. Um, it just has to do with the fact that you're going to take a system of atoms in a conductor that are all connected to each other. They all feel each other's pressure. So all the electrons, you move one electron, you essentially start moving all of them. And sort of a simple way of understanding, you know, what's happening inside the wire, they'll, they'll talk about silly things like drift velocity, but it doesn't really have anything to do with it. So when you hit them with the high velocity, there's really the thing that's going to take place is when one electron moves into another electron, it's not necessarily moving into one that's in the same position as it's in, right? So the one it's moving into is a valence electron. So it's in a different position relative to a proton, right? And so one is hitting another one. So this one could have been on the opposite side of a, a proton. This one could be on the side of a proton. And so what you really end up doing is, is there's going to be a lot of tension between these electrons as they get pushed out and there's going to be a tendency, okay, because the electrons are in tension, to sort of move them in these directions rather than in the straight line. But the faster it goes, you could argue the straighter it goes through the wire. So the faster you go, the less influence, drag, you could call it even, the less connection you have to these other electrons. The, the, the bonding here isn't going to be as strong as the bond you're going to be, def you know, you're going to be applying more pressure this way than you're going to be applying this way. So you're going to apply pressure both directions, but more of it's going this way, and especially when you're going fast, a lot more of it goes straight. So you could think of it sort of like sound. Sound only works when you get to a certain velocity. You create a sonic boom, okay, <laughs> and that's essentially when you can start making the sound go very straight. But if you don't go that fast velocity, all of the other atoms start stealing your velocity and moving in a different direction. So you lose all your energy to going in directions that aren't in the direction of the sound. So you want all of the energy to go in the direction that you want the sound to perpetuate in, okay? And you want as little as possible to be dragged out of it, frictioned out of it. So the faster you can move something, the more likely it is the sound will travel in a straight line. That's the sonic boom. All right, and the same thing probably happens in a wire. There's some sort of speed that really makes it easy for electricity to travel um, in a straight line. And below that speed, it gets dragged by all of these valence electrons that are going to pull some of the energy in this direction. So there's a tendency to go in this direction, but I could make the subtle argument that because <laughs> The electrons are bound this way that it gets pulled in this direction. So in the direction of the voltage, you might understand that the electrons, you know, I made this argument so many times, but this is how the universe works. An electron is sitting somewhere, 
and all it can do is do this or it can do this okay <laughs> if it does this then the reflected energy is going to be really weak you see how weak this hand is it's one fourth what this hand is see this one's really weak okay and this one's really strong so that's the idea is you're going to either push you know compress the energy the electron make more reflections or make a lot less reflections so you can see that the the field of energy is going to be compressed or it's going to be relaxed okay <laughs> depending on which way the electrons going going into okay it's going to compress the field going away from in the other direction it's going to be relaxing the field so when my hand moves that way got relaxed this way got compressed and vice versa okay and that's 90 percent 99 percent of what the universe is doing this is this is electromagnetism this is the electromagnetic event is this electrons moving that's causing compressions and relaxations in the field of energy that everything is in all right so you can sort of understand that that's what's going to happen inside this wire when you have electricity going through it you're going to have a bunch of electrons that are going to be pushing out that wouldn't have been pushing out okay they wouldn't be doing it if there wasn't electrons coming through the wire so because electrons are going through the wire a bunch of electrons are going to push out okay and then go back in and then push out and then go back in and then push out and go back in and they're going to be doing it in a direction that is they're going to be pushing out this way right and this way they're going to be sort of doing the opposite well they can't do the opposite so that's a silly thing for me to say they're going to be doing the same thing along this whole wire okay and what's going to be opposite is is that every time the electron pushes out you can understand that now it's exposing something it's changing the appearance and the fact is is when it pushes out it's going to be making the proton here let's say and the proton here and the proton here it's going to be making all of those protons visible so as it pushes out it makes this proton visible it's hiding it when it's compressed and inside close to the atom but when you move it away and in a direction <laughs> the other direction ends up turning redder so you can sort of see from this side it's going to look red from this side it's going to look bluer now it's not completely blue and red it's just that it's bluer and redder okay so this fits perfectly with the idea that okay so i have electricity going this way in the wire now i have another parallel wire and i'm doing exactly the same thing in that parallel wire right i'm pushing this way i'm pushing this way so the current's going the same direction all right i'm pushing this way 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 you can sort of get the idea that oh okay these okay these um same polarization you could argue right it has the, it's the same direction but they're going to end up being attractive because what the north side so if you saw the blue as the north magnet and you saw the red as the south magnet or plus and minus you get the idea that you have the opposites will see each other the opposites will see each other now and so they're going to attract so even though they have energy going in the same direction they look like it's two magnets you know it's it's the voltage is 12 volts here and it's six volts here you know there's a differential in the voltage that makes it look like it's polarized but it's not polarized in the sense that the pressure is going the same way so the signal this is going to be seeing the back end of this wire's result and this one's going to see the back end of that wire's result so this blue is going to see a red and this red's going to see a blue and you know so it's all going to end up matching the the fields are going to be opposites which means their two wires are now going to attract and then if I do the opposite experiment all right <clears throat> so it seems very unintuitive because this is against what electrons and protons do right I mean likes are supposed to repel likes aren't supposed to attract but the understanding is is the likes can't see forward they can only see the behind 
This one can only see backwards, and this one can only see this side backwards. They can't see what's happening forward. They can only see what's happening backward. So that's why they end up attracting. Because they're going to see the opposite pole, essentially. All right, so now if I have the energy going the opposite way, you can see the, the, the exact, you know, you can see, you can understand. Uh, you can probably anticipate it just as a, why would I make the video if I didn't already know the answer? Um, that obviously now with the pressure going this way, the blue arrows are going this way, and now you can see the problem. That even though these are now opposites, the blue can see the blue, and the blue can see the blue, and the blue can see the blue, and the red can see the red, the red can see the red, the red can see the red. And so now these are going to repel. Okay. And that's the nature of the electricity. So the field seems perpendicular. Okay. That would be the argument is the magnetism is perpendicular, but it's really not. Okay. It has a component that's perpendicular. Okay. This, this, this subtle bend in the line, okay, still has this component. This is the component of the force that way. Okay, away, pressure away or pressure towards in terms of a positive or negative field. So you could reduce it to the angular amount and say there's this much blue and there's this much red and then you can, you know, do the, the math that way. But I'm just saying because it has a component perpendicular doesn't mean that the energy itself is perpendicular. The energy is tangential, not perpendicular. I think that about does that argument. All right, so where do you know? I uh, so yeah, I'll read the 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 diagram, but I just point out they can't draw this for you. Okay, they don't have any drawing. They don't have any explanation at all why the wires attract or why they repel. They have some notion that there's a spinning something around the wire, and this one has a spinning thing around the wire, and somehow if they're opposite spinning, they they'll they'll if, if one's going clockwise and one's going counterclockwise, that somehow they'll attract. And if they're both going clockwise, you know, one's going counterclockwise, one's going clockwise, that somehow that will cause them to repel. But they really don't have any, there's no evidence that anything is actually spinning around the wire. They can't make anything spin around the wire, okay? They can't put a piece of dust there and make it spin around the wire is it doesn't happen that way. The reason why it's spinning is because, the reason why it's creating the effect is because there is this tangential energy in the direction of the current and voltage. The direction of the harassment of the electrons expands the wire in that direction. The wire gets fatter, okay, as you push pressure into it, essentially, and the fatness changes the appearance. All right. Changes how it's reflecting <laughs> the universe. All right. So, leave us go to the crud they wrote. All right. Uh, just to be fair. Like I said, so what they're going to say doesn't really have anything to do with anything you could visualize or you could draw. They're just going to tell you there's X field and it's doing X thing, but it's just completely unimaginable as a physical concept. All right, the concept of electric potential is closely linked to that of electric of the electric field. So again, they're playing a game with the field. The field is just the the force itself, and you can only change the frequency. You can change how a force looks, but you can't change how much force there is. The electrons aren't flying off of the wire. So understand, they're just being pushed out and then they come back again. They push out and they come back again. They're not flying off the wire. So they're just moving like this. And when they move, they can't make more light. They can only compress it or expand it in space, but they can't make more photons. They can only make more photons in a piece of the space. But then as soon as I push out, I stop pushing out. I'm not making any more photons, right? I can't make more photons. I can just compress the photons, the bits. Like if it was a sand and sand was coming at me, I can't make more sand because the sand would have reflected if I left my hand back here. Sooner or later, it would have hit my hand. So I can't make more sand. 
Well, technically, right? If I, if I push into a field, right? But it's an infinite field, so it, you can't really change how much it's hitting your hand. See, in an infinite field, like if I put a million, billion LED lights, I can't change how much light hits my hand. You know, it doesn't matter how far away I am, how close I am, the same amount of photons always hits my hand. So you can't change how much energy. You can only change how much space the energy is in. It's probably the best way to say it. All right. A small charge placed within an electric field. <clears throat> so again, <laughs> the, the electric field is just how much of this, you know, electron force, the blue stuff, versus the red stuff. The blue stuff pushes the electrons. The red stuff doesn't do anything. It's inert. So to an electron. So that's all you're really just saying is how much blue stuff. All right, uh, experiences a force and to have brought that charge to the point against the force requires work. So, all right, a small charge placed within an electric field experiences a force. So clearly everything is going to be affected and it's just about what's hitting you and that's going to push you. So if I increase how much stuff is hitting you, I turn on the cell phone, See, even turning on the cell phone, you're not changing how much energy again. You're just changing how it's reflecting the energy. So it's, a, it's a really key concept. And to have <coughs> brought that charge to that point against the force requires work. All right, so um, let's see how to say that. Well, regardless, you're going to absorb the force to push it. So if, a, if you put a sailboat in the wind, it decreases the wind to move the sailboat. If you put the boat in the stream, the stream loses energy to move the boat. So yeah, every time you move an electron, you have to absorb energy. All right. The electric phenomenon at any point is defined as the energy required to bring a unit test charge from an infinite distance slowly to that point. So obviously that's kind of, a, it's not a very useful way of defining the electrical potential. All you're really saying is, if you want to just understand what electric potential is, it's just the pressure between the electrons. They have more pressure, the voltage is higher. If they're closer, if they're closer to each other, more pressure, more voltage. If they're further away from each other, less pressure, less voltage. All right, it is usually measured in volts. And one volt is the potential for which one joule of work must be expended to bring a charge of one coulomb from coulomb from infinity. So again, this infinity thing is they're, they're trying to convert into like a gravitational thing. And what's the total energy you can derive, um, you know, from attracting something and, you know, at the infinite distance, <laughs> but, you know, obviously it doesn't matter. Very far away is going to be the same as infinity. This definition of potential, I mean, it's going to be such a tiny amount of difference in the voltage between a light year away and 10 light years away. The voltage is going to be, you know, the numbers are going to be 0. 0.000000, you know, it's going to be a, 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 such a fractional difference. This definition of potential, while formal, is a little... It has little practical application, so why do you even bother with it? A more useful concept is that electrical potential difference, yes, that's all you need to know, uh, is the relative difference. And it is the energy required to move one unit charge between two specified points. So that's pretty ambiguous, right? <laughs> specified points, uh, specified by what? An electric field has the special property that it is conservative. So again, that's just absolutely nonsensical to call uh, conservation a special property when, frankly, everything has to be conserved. Every bit of force and motion in the universe has to be conserved. <sighs> I don't know if I want to say it that way. The more matter you put in the universe, the more force is going to be busy pushing the matter. Therefore, the pressure in the universe is going to be reduced because more of it's moving slower matter. So in a sense, the f speed of light is not conserved when you're moving matter. It's only conserved when the force is moving the speed of light. When the force is busy moving matter, it's lost a little of its mojo. Which means that the path taken by the test charge is invariant. Ir 
relevant. Well, so uh, this is the argument of they're they're saying it's irrelevant if you move sideways in gravity, but it's not really because you're still in the gravity, right? So it's not irrelevant. <laughs> so um, let's see how to. I mean, you obviously can't just move sideways and not move forward at the same time. So your sideways motion has to be added motion. It can't be a change in your direction. It has to be added energy going sideways. So you retain the energy. So it's like throwing a baseball off a train. You keep the energy of the baseball going in the direction you threw it, but you're adding energy in some other direction. So you're, you're adding two different vectors. All baths between two specified points expend the same energy. So it really isn't true, but you can't possibly add energy without changing the path. So, all right. And thus, a unique value for potential difference may be stated. <clears throat> so isn't that all gobbledygooky? I mean, is that really explaining to you that the electrical potential is just a, a completely controlled by how much pressure you're putting into uh, a bunch of spring connected electrons. The electrons are all connected to each other with a little spring and when you push on one all of the springs start springing. That's the true nature of potential. Um, the volt, I mean it's just it could be analogized to you know magnets pushing magnets together or pushing springs. It's, it's a perfect analogy for the increase in the voltage. You're just increasing the pressure between the electrons. The volt is also strongly identified as a unit of choice for measurement and description of electric potential differences that the term voltage sees greater everyday usage. Well, I don't know what other term they used. <laughs> so they didn't give me the other alternative term. I wonder what it is. Sparkiness? Sparkiness. Yeah, okay. So you could have said sparkiness, and it's the same as voltage. But nobody uses that anymore. Uh, for practical purposes, it's useful to define a common reference point to which the potentials may be expressed and compared. So there's no such thing as an uncompressed spring, and there's no such thing as a completely compressed spring. So the argument is, is, is that all you have is relative amounts of pressure. You can't eliminate the pressure. You can't, uh, you know, to nothing. There's no no pressure. So there's only pressures relative to each other. And we just um, assign a certain amount of pressure and call that zero. And then say when it's less pressure, it's a negative number. When it's a higher pressure, it's a higher number. But the fact is, there's no such thing as the negative voltage. There's only lower positive voltages. So again, they don't really get into that distinction that they're just playing a word game when they say there's such a thing as a negative voltage. There's no such thing as a negative voltage. Okay, while this could be at infinity, a much more useful reference is the Earth itself, which is assumed to be at the same potential everywhere. So the fact is the Earth is a conductor, you could argue, uh, that generally speaking... There's water in the ground. There's lots of things. So there's lots of ways for the electricity to the charge to move. It's not made out of an insulator. So there's lots of conductor in the earth. And so therefore, lots of different mass is all spreading its pressure, its voltage. So all the little pieces of the ground gain a voltage and they all neutralize it and turn it into one voltage. So lightning hits, it creates a high pressure at the point. The conductors can't handle it and all melt. But the fact is, is the pressure dissipates into the earth and just becomes um, neutralized by the gazillions of little <clears throat> atoms. It's going to spread its pressure across. So it's going to spread the pressure of one volt, let's say, over a bazillion <laughs> electrons and therefore it's going to be a tiny tiny increase in the charge potential or the voltage of the earth it's just going to be dampened by the volume that the earth has so the volume of the earth means you can't raise the charge on the earth the, the battery voltage of the earth you can't raise its voltage because it's such a gigantic battery all right this reference point naturally takes the name earth or ground <coughs> 
So, but it's and it's just you look. The simple point they're making is, is we have this arbitrarily assigned pressure. So the average pressure of the Earth, which might be less than the pressure on the Moon, we don't know, um, is just a, a fact of the circumstance. It's just that this is how much the electrons, this is how much pressure the electrons are under on Earth. Now, I think that would probably have something to do with gravity. And so gravity probably creates a higher charge potential. The stronger the gravity is on the surface, the higher the pressure is overall in the planet. So you could argue that planets under higher pressure have a higher electrical potential. Earth is assumed to be an infinite source of equal amounts of positive and negative charge. So there's no such thing as the negative charge. There's just the fact that the voltage is completely a measurement of the amount of negative charge, the amount of negative pressure, the amount of pressure between the electrons. The protons do not play a role. There is no positive element in electricity. There's just the volume of negative charge. And you make a higher volume of negative charge, you have a higher electrical potential in the same space. Uh, and this <laughs> and is therefore electrically uncharged and unchargeable. So unchanged and unchangeable, I guess it says. No, it's just chargeable. All right. Electrical potential is a scalar quantity. So I hate this concept. This word is just so disgusting. Nothing is a scalar. Okay, there's just no such thing as a scalar in the universe. The universe is just made of motion, and everything that moves moves in a straight line. And there are only vectors. The whole universe is a vector quantity. That's all there are. There's just vectors of energy in the universe. There's no other thing possible. Just vectors. No scalars. Uh, that is, it only has magnitude and not direction. So there's no such thing as directionless energy. Energy has to be on the move to be energy. And it has to be moving in one direction. <laughs> Okay, no, there's nothing else. It's just silly to, to make up this story that there's some sort of energy that doesn't know where it is or where it's going. Doesn't happen, doesn't exist. It may be viewed as analogous to height. I don't know how there's any analogy here. So electrical potential may be analogized to height. <laughs> no, sorry. Just as a released object will fall through a differential in heights caused by a gravitational field. So you could argue that, yes, that would make sense if you understood that the electrons are under pressure. Like gravity creates pressure and you have different amounts of pressure depending on how much mass you're on top of. And that will change the voltage of the planet based on what the gravitational potential is. And so I just said that. But it really the core creator of the potential is the fact of pushing the electrons closer to each other. You have to push electrons closer to each other to increase potential. So a charge will fall across the voltage caused by an electric field. No, it will move into less pressure. So you're just going to say a charge can move into less pressure. It can't move into the same pressure. And it certainly can't move into greater pressure. So that's a simple rule. It goes from high pressure to low pressure. Always like heat. It goes from hot to cold. It doesn't go from cold to hot. As relief maps show contour lines making points of equal height, a set of lines marking points of equal potential. So again, this is now they're talking about this abstraction of the field created. And the field created, again, is nuanced. Um, but yes, it's, it's true that you can have these places where a magnet will turn or a charge will stay in one place based on the fact that it's being pulled and repelled. So you could say that there's a equal potential around the atom. Those could be what you call the energy levels. And those are equal potentials where the force pushing the electron away is equal to the amount of traction the, the electron has to the proton. All right. Uh, may also draw around electrostatically charged objects. So really, the, these are this again, we're getting into this argument about lines of force versus field line. So let me just let me just draw that real quick again. Uh, you know, it's really important to make the distinction and physics is really bad at making this distinction. Uh, just the truth. All right. 
okay so the charge is doing this okay it's reflecting the universe in this per perpendicular manner okay and so this is all it's doing it's just stuff is flying off of it in a straight line and, and an equal kind of amount of it, it depending on what's coming in is going to decide what comes out and whether the electron moves these are the lines of force and if i put another electron here then there's going to be places where the force between this electron and this electron will be equal that is the same number of lines will hit each other if i move this one closer then the equal to potential line would be here i move it further away then the equal potential line would be here where the two forces have an equal push so if i put another electron in between here it would be moved okay to represent what's the negative force here the negative pressure here which are, are Oh, and it would end up being right between the two of them, frankly. Um, but those are, those field lines are not the same as the lines of force. The lines of force are the only real thing. The field line is a, it's sort of an abstraction. It's a representation of an emergent consequence. It's not a, a representation of something elemental. It's a representation of something that emerges from the elemental function. And I should really make that distinction. All right. Back to the crap. All right. Maybe drawn around electric statically charged objects. The equal potentials cross all lines of force at right angles. So that's the only point here is that where these lines cross, the equal potential line is always perpendicular to those lines. All right. So you could, you know. Obviously, there would be billions of these, and so this would be a very unaleased line. But the fact is, you could draw it with just four lines, and you'd end up with a very, you know, not a very round line. Um, but the fact is, if you put all the lines of force in, you'd get a very round line. So this is an adequate drawing of it. All right. Um, so those lines really aren't representing anything real. The real thing is the red and the green. <laughs> that's the real part. And that stuff's coming off straight. So that's these lines are perpendicular to the lines doing this. Those lines are perpendicular to those lines. But they didn't draw the lines of force. Okay. They must also be parallel to a conductor's surface. So this is the part that's a little tricky because I'm arguing that no, they're not really parallel. The lines of force are actually in a direction but they have a component that's parallel. So that's the, that's the part they missed. They're not getting it, that only a component is parallel. The lines themselves are actually just tangential because they're a, a composite of two energies. The energy of the force pushing the electrons in a direction and then the, uh, the fact that the electrons are bound in this direction. So the electrons are bound in this direction and this direction and they're being pushed in this direction and you end up with something like that that still has a component that way. All right, <clears throat> the equal potentials cross all lines of force at right angles. They must also lie parallel to the conductor's surface, so that's just wrong, since otherwise there would be a force along the surface of the conductor that would move the charge carriers to even the potential across the surface. So it's just not true because what they're seeing is what, what they can only see the part that affects them. So this is almost like a gravity argument. I can only see the change created by an electron that moves towards me. I can't see the change created by the electron that moves away from me because that force is going to be the other way. It's not going to affect me. It's not going to hit me. It wasn't going to hit me anyway. The energy going that way wasn't going to hit me. All right, the electric field was formally defined as the force exerted per unit charge, but the concept of potential allows for a more useful and equivalent definition. <sighs> the electric field. Um, and again, the, the field is completely a, a consequence of how much pressure you're pushing on the electrons. More pressure, more compression of the field. The electric field is a local gradient of the electrical potential. 
So again, the electric field is a consequence of moving electrons, and when you move the electrons, they create an emergent consequence to the rest of the universe. They change the universe's pattern. They, they make whatever they're in look different when they're moving. Usually expressed as volts per meter, the vector direction of the field is the line of greatest slope of potential and where the equal potentials lie closest together. So that's just a consequence of the inverse square law and um, doesn't have much to do with the fact that the magnetic field is an emergent. It happens just as a side effect. There's no extra energy going out of the wire. The only thing that's going out of the wire is a different reflection to the universe. All right. So we could do electromagnets again, but this is really just a copy of the stuff I did in the other paper about uh, Orsted and uh, magnets and motion. And the important part is this rotation in the field. I'm arguing there's, there's no rotation in the field. The rotation is in that direction, you know, going that way and going that way. And that's what's causing something to not be able to find a balanced position because the cones are going in the opposite direction. So there is no place where there's an equal potential. And that's why nothing wants to stay there is because it's, it's, it's always an imbalanced field. But this is, that's more, it gets more complicated when we start talking about the magnetic field. So I think I'll just do magnetism and then we can talk some more about creating an artificial magnetic field versus a static magnetic field. I think that's the way to go. So electric power really is an interesting. It's just talking about wattage amps and volts equals watts. That's not very complicated. Um, the electromagnetic wave, again, is just this part. So that's not much of a paragraph, frankly. And it's just, again, all this Maxwell crap. Um, and it's really not a wave. It's just a frequency. So all you're doing is compressing how much energy there is in a certain amount of space. And by compressing the energy, it means that when it hits a surface, it can do more damage in a smaller amount of time. And that often will disrupt an atom. Atoms need time to absorb energy, just like any physical object needs time to absorb energy. If you don't give it time to absorb the energy, it will break your structure. Uh, so it's the same tipping point type argument. You can disrupt atoms with high compressions of energy not more energy. So if you can shoot the 10 bullets in one second, it'll do more damage than if you shoot the 10 bullets, you know, in 10 seconds. All right, so that's probably enough. And such and so forth and whatnot. So Wikipedia won't hear any of these arguments. They won't allow you to make any of these arguments. Um, they will not allow the counter theory to be seen. They won't link to it. They won't suggest there even could be a counter theory. Uh, none of it is on there. The 17 people they ask, what's the truth? If those people don't say it, then it's not a truth. And that's all this physics has turned into is a tiny number of people are telling everybody else what they must believe. And it's really not what science should be. Science should be open. It should be well discussed, well tested. Um, you know, all of these arguments should be heard and countered, not run away from. All right. So till the next time and such, so forth and whatnot.